If you know how the world financial system works, you know the game that you're playing. And if you don't know the game and the rules that we're playing by, you're going to get slaughtered. You are going to get slaughtered. Ever since the Federal Reserve was born, we have been living under a lie. In order for us to maintain the levels we've got and to maintain the prosperity, Obama has to be twice as far in debt when he leaves office than when he came in, or we, the whole thing is starting to collapse. The Federal Reserve, they're buying bonds directly from the Treasury. This is quantitative easing, they're calling it. And that means there's an emergency going on. I could see that there wasn't anything in history, as far as finances go, that it was as much of a sure thing as gold and silver accounting for the expansion of the fiat currency supply. There's absolutely no chance in hell that this won't happen. Right now it takes about $15,000 to $20,000 an ounce gold. I believe that there's going to be deflation first, and then all of the world's central banks will start printing like crazy to get us out of that deflation and Ben Bernanke will be leading the charge. And you can't have a debt that is 10 times the size of your economy. It's not possible. Everything comes to a screeching halt first. I got to show you that the world's uh, stock markets and real estate bubbles have to continue crashing because all it is is the market trying to seek fair value. It's trying to seek equilibrium this is what the markets do. It is their job. Basically, you know, our entire currency system is imaginary. It doesn't really exist. It's just that we're all dreaming the same dream. If anybody chooses to wake up, it's over with. Thank you very much. I'm Mike Maloney, uh, author of the best-selling book on precious metals investing. Guide to Investing in Gold and Silver. It's part of uh, the Rich Dad series that Robert Kiyosaki started. The original book, Robert Kiyosaki says, write a book. No other instructions, write a book. And so I started writing this book, two and a half years of research and writing, probably 30 hours a week, every week for two and a half years. It's a very well-researched book. I, the one thing that I really worry about is perpetuating misinformation. I do not, I want to be accurate. And then I try and boil it down and make it real simple. I read all these books by economists like Milton Friedman, Murray Rothbard, uh, Ben Bernanke. If you get a chance to read some Ben Bernanke, don't. <laughs> he's, a, he's a horrible author, just horrible. They're all trying to write over each other's heads and impress each other. And by doing so, they make economics sound so complex that everybody thinks, well, I can't understand economics. It's really simple. It's, economics is very simple if you boil it down to its essence. And it's not that difficult to understand, and that's what I try to do in my book. Uh, for the people that have not read my book, um, uh, about 75% of it is not about uh, investing in gold and silver. It's some history of money and then uh, how the global economy works and what could potentially happen. You know, where, so it's where we came from, where we are today, and what could potentially happen. By the way, I really couldn't care less about gold and silver. I don't want gold and silver. It's just in its cycle right now. It's a stupid lump of metal that doesn't have cash flow or, or spin off dividend yields. And so I don't want gold and silver. It's just that right now, I don't want anything else. <laughs> they're just in their cycle right now, and they're going to be outperforming everything else, in my opinion, from all of my research. And you're going to be able to buy a whole lot more other stuff, a whole lot more real estate, a whole lot more stocks, a whole lot more oil wells, farmland. All the true wealth is in the buildings, the businesses, the farmland that's out there. And people get this picture in their head that if there's economic, this economic disaster, if there was some sort of collapse, that it's going to be like this nuclear wasteland afterwards. It's not. All the buildings are still going to be there, the apartment buildings. It's just that they're all going to be on sale. The problem is, when investments are on sale, nobody buys. 
they only, the public comes charging in and they chase investments after they're going up. Gold and silver get hot whenever they're going up, and as soon as we see them take a dip, it's like sales turn off like a light switch most of the time. And I don't want anybody to get slaughtered. Uh, I, I really don't want these bad things to happen. I just think that all the evidence is there that what our leaders have done to the economic system is going to cause these things to have it happen, and it's inevitable. And I am trying to warn as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. My company has a mission to get as much gold and silver in the hands of the middle class as quickly as possible because when there is great economic upheaval, there is great political change. It usually goes along with it. In the hyperinflation in Weimar, Germany in 1923, this hyperinflation ended on November 15, 1923. On November 8th, one week before the end of the hyperinflation, Hitler's stormtroopers pointed machine guns at the front door of the Burger Brau Keller where there was a political meeting. This is a big beer hall where there were about 3,000 people listening to political speeches. And on that night, he took the stage at gunpoint and to this literally captive audience gave a speech that would change the world. Nobody knew the name Hitler. Nobody knew who he was until he gave this speech to a newly impoverished middle class, people that were scared and looking for somebody to lead them. And here this charismatic guy takes the stage, gives them a scapegoat and says, I know the way out of this. The next day, they, the, those people in that beer hall followed him to try and do a military, a, a coup to take, to take over the government. And it failed. He was imprisoned. He was tried for high treason. His trial went on for an entire month. And during that month, he had the ear of the nation. He was covered in every newspaper all across Germany, and the judges were uh, sympathetic to his beliefs. So they let him go on for hours on end with these speeches. And that's when he gained power. It was when the middle class was scared. The middle class defines a country with their vote. The, the, the country, as the middle class goes, so goes the country. And so what I am worried about isn't the loss of my financial uh, well-being. It's the loss of capitalism. It's the loss of uh, our quality of life. It's the loss of our freedom of choice. That's what I'm worried about. And I know that there's certain people that I'm not going to be able to reach. Joe Sixpack, I refer to the guy that uh, comes out of his beer and football-induced coma <laughs> at the very end of a bull market and comes charging in and buys at the peak. I can't do anything for him. I'm hoping that I can do something for all of you. These are wealth cycles. If you have two asset classes that are rising, you have, for instance, let's say that this is real estate on the bottom, and on the top here we've got precious metals. Precious metals in the pat this last decade here uh, precious metals outperformed real estate and stocks, uh, but everything went up. Stocks went up, bonds went up, real estate went up, and so did commodities and precious metals. Is that possible? Can everything go up? Think about it for a minute. You've only got so much stuff in society, and if you've got these three, three or four asset classes, and everybody rushes toward one, pushing it into a bubble, shouldn't it be drawing currency away from the others? Shouldn't the others be going down? Well, they didn't in the last decade. And what's happening here, if you've got two things that are going up, if you're invested in this one down here, when you go to sell, you can't buy as much of this one. If you're invested in this one, when you sell, you can buy more of this one. They are both rising in price. This one is falling in value. When you sell it, you can't buy as much gold or food or oil. Your house is worth uh, half as much in oil as it was. It, oil was 10 bucks a barrel in 1999. So your house measured in oil has crashed. The stock market measured in oil has crashed. If you start looking at your home or all of your investments and you divide them by something else, you measure them in the price of wheat, a, a bushel of wheat, a pound of, uh, I, of copper, a ton of iron, uh, shares of the Dow or ounces of gold, 
you're going to discover something. These two things that are going up, eventually, the people that are invested in this one realize that that's, the smart investors realize that that's going into a bubble. They sell and they buy the undervalued asset. And then this trend reverses. It can't go on forever if it did. If gold outperformed real estate forever, there would come a day where one ounce of gold would buy the entire planet, and we all know that that can't happen, right? So eventually one becomes overvalued and the other one becomes undervalued and the cycle reverses. And then it reverses again. And what is happening is they're printing currency at about this rate, and that's the reason you can't see it. People will say, well, uh, at least my house is, is worth uh, $100,000 more than it was in the year 2000, or it's, or it's worth 20% more. Well, in if inflation was 40%, it actually went down in value. Uh, they'll say that, uh, you know, they look at the stock market, and the Dow right now is just barely above its 2000 high. It's a lost decade. Stocks have gone sideways for a decade, and we've had inflation during that time. They inflated the currency supply. So, if you start measuring one thing with another thing, so you're measuring stuff against stuff, instead of using currency, what you discover is that everything is trapped in this valuation channel, where it goes from overvalued to undervalued to overvalued to undervalued again, and there's the thing that you're measuring it with is doing the exact opposite mirrored wave. The trick is, sell the overvalued asset, near a peak if you can, find the undervalued asset, and I call this wealth cycles. Uh, and if you can do that, it's a, it's a road to true wealth. You're escaping that valuation channel. Uh, so here is a real example. This is the Dow measured in points. And what are points? The points are derived by uh, the dollar value of the underlying stocks. So basically, it's, it's points are dollars. And one of the reasons that they measure it in points is just like if you go to Las Vegas, they take your currency and they give you chips. And now it's just pieces of plastic, so you don't care. You're just having fun. <laughs> so change it to points. And it's not as bad as if, well, we lost so many dollars. It went down so many points. It's, uh, but anyway, that's the down measured in points. But if you go every month during this entire graph from the year 1900 to today, and each day, you take the points on the Dow and divide it by the price of gold, you get how many ounces of gold one share of the Dow is worth. And this is what it looks like measured in gold. It's not going anywhere. It's got a mean of about four ounces of gold, which means that the price of gold should be one quarter the points of the Dow, and then things are sort of in equilibrium. Uh, it's fair value when the Dow is only four times the price of gold. But what you see here, is that it goes, into, it goes from fair value into a bubble, 18 ounces of gold, crashes down to two ounces, another bubble, 28 ounces of gold, because the bubble was bigger, because they print more currency in the meantime. When it crashed, it went down to one ounce of gold. There was a day in 1980 where gold was 850 and the Dow was at 850 points. One ounce of gold bought the Dow. Conversely, if you cash out, you could only buy one ounce of gold with the proceeds of your stocks. And then we go into the biggest bubble in history. There is no time in history, this point in 1999-2000, there is no time that gold was as unloved and ignored as in that time period. It was no nation's money. It had gone down for 20 years. It was the worst investment you could possibly make. Nobody wanted it. Take this. This is the price of the Dow measured in gold. Flip it upside down, and you've got the price of gold measured in the Dow. Put these two things together, and what you find is that there's a cycle here. And if you had ridden stocks up to 1929 and then sold your stocks and bought gold, and then in 1932 gone to uh, gold, uh, and then uh, gone to, back to stocks, I mean, and then in uh, 1980, go back into gold and, and, uh, and so on. Um, this is a road to true wealth. I mean, you're making massive gains here. I show two hypothetical families in my book, and one goes from 35 bucks to 11,000 bucks over that time period, and the other one goes from 35 bucks to 11 million. 
and that is the difference. One family creates a dynasty, the other one didn't even break even. Uh, this is the gold-dow ratio instead of the dow-gold ratio, so you're measuring gold's value per ounce, measured in what percentage of a share of the uh, dow that it will buy. And what it's showing is that gold is nowhere near a bubble. It's very undervalued here. It still has to go up. Uh, the mean should be 25% or more. And in every bubble in history and in, in nature and in, uh, I used to be a, an electronics engineer in, in physics, when something is out of whack, when it reverts back to the mean, it overshoots. If it's more out of whack, when it reverts to the mean, it overshoots further. So I'm expecting a day where the price of gold will be double or more the points on the Dow. This is the silver Dow ratio. <laughs> silver has just, I mean, the gains here should be immense. Uh, this is just uh, gold for the past decade. I, I just challenge anybody to go and find an index or a stock or anything that looks that good over the last 10 years. This is a perfect chart. It's very bullish. There's nothing here saying that gold, in this information that you're looking at, this is what technical analysts look at when they're trying to figure out whether to buy an asset or sell an asset. And uh, uh, this is saying that gold is probably going to continue rising. There's nothing bearish in that signal. Uh, this is the S&P 500 over the last decade, so representing stocks, the 500 largest companies in America, and there's gold. Uh, here we have silver, and uh, I recently spoke at the 8th Annual Banking Conference in Sochi, Russia. This is the uh, big banking conference for all of Europe and Russia. And um, I uh, was showing them this at the very end. They cut me off. It was, it was really interesting. I was running out of time, and uh, the, you hear this voice come over the loudspeaker, and it is their finance minister in their parliament telling me, Mr. Maloney, Mr. Maloney, you've got to stop now, Mr. Maloney. They were trying to cut me off. I was presenting this information that they did not want presented at this conference. And then he comes up to me afterwards to get, he's got a copy of my book that he bought. <laughs> he wants it signed. <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, please visit our table afterwards. We're giving away, these are $100 trillion bills. They're real, they're from Zimbabwe. We're giving away $20 quadrillion at my table. So uh, <laughs> come, come and get your $100 trillion. Uh, okay, so uh, what I showed here was that there was an inverted head and shoulders, and this works just as well upside down as it does right side up. You can see the head hanging, it's like this guy's hanging from his feet. This is the head and shoulders that I'm tracing out here in blue. And then you uh, draw across the neckline and you invert that head in the predicted move. And you'll see this if you watch my, if you Google $10 oil, you'll see a video where I'm, he's cutting me off and I'm sort of flashing through this. I don't get a chance to describe it. But I was predicting that silver would make a big move. And guess what? That's what silver did. It, it doubled from where it was. This is the spot price of silver. This is the price of silver IOUs. The price of gold and silver is determined by people going, I owe you 5,000 ounces of silver. I owe you 5,000 ounces of silver. I owe you 5,000 ounces of silver. And they're handing these things out. And they're trading these IOUs on the commodities exchange. And that's what determines the worldwide spot price. Now, you can do these naked, it's called a naked short. If you don't have the silver to cover it, if you're not sitting on a pile of silver and you're writing IOUs, you can still sell them. And some big banks do this, like JP Morgan. Uh, and they'll crash a market and then uh, come in and, and uh, cover their shorts. They buy those, those IOUs back at a lower price than they sold them for and they, make, they get to make the spread. They, uh, fleece the public and, uh, and uh, some funds that invest in silver for hundreds of millions of dollars by doing this. And they do it on a, they've done it on a regular basis. But silver fell too low this time, and so did gold. And 
uh, investors that were looking for physical realized it was just too cheap and they all had to get some and shortages developed. And uh, all across India, Europe, and North America, the cupboards were bare. There were three months where we could only get one silver product at a time and we had no gold. There, we, we didn't have gold at my dealership for three months and I deal with four of the world's largest wholesalers and they could not find gold for us. People don't realize how much gold and silver there is on the planet. There are 6.6 uh, .6 billion people on the planet. There are only 2.2 billion ounces of gold. That's a third of an ounce per person. Silver is even more rare. There's only about a 14th of an ounce per person. That means that 14 people have to share that same one ounce of silver. <laughs> and right now, you can get a whole lot for your, for your currency. Uh, I'm going to take a little detour here. I did not define the difference between currency and money, and you will hear me say currency, currency, currency over and over and over again. Uh, back before World War I, uh, each note that a treasury issued, each, each uh, dollar in existence in the United States, would say that there have been deposited with the United States Treasury $20 in gold coin payable to the bearer upon demand. The money was in the vault. The currency was a note they gave you that was a claim check, only a claim check on the money, the same as if you go to the dry cleaners and you, get your, you give them your shirt and they give you a claim check for your shirt. The value is, is that shirt at the dry cleaners, not the piece of paper that says that you own that shirt. So our currency that circulated was the paper US dollars and they were claim checks on money. And people do not understand that money has to be a store of value. Only gold and silver qualify as money. They, they have all the attributes that you need. They're portable, durable, divisible, fungible, uh, and then money is a store of value over long periods of time. One of the things that I always start with is how currency is created, because if you know how the world financial system works, you know the game that you're playing. And if you don't know the game and the rules that we're playing by, you're going to get slaughtered. You are going to get slaughtered. So this, just by knowing this, increases your odds just a hundredfold of winning. Uh, so, uh, when you or I write a check, there must be sufficient funds in our account to cover the check. But when the Federal Reserve writes a check, there is no bank deposit on which that check is drawn. When the Federal Reserve writes a check, it is creating money. And that is, putting it simply, from the Boston Federal Reserve's website. Basically, the way this works is, the tre in the United States, it's the US Treasury, uh, but every country has the, the equivalent of our Treasury. So the Treasuries around the world uh, create a bond. And what is a bond? A bond is just an IOU. Loan me, to, loan me a trillion bucks, and I promise that over a 30-year period, I'm going to pay you back two trillion. That's basically a bond, IOU. And <clears throat> there's something in the middle here called open market operations that I'm going to just show you real quickly. But it, the open market operations is just a shell game that uh, obscures what is truly going on. So banks show up at the treasury auctions, the, the uh, primary dealers they're called. And then the Federal Reserve comes along. And through open market operations, they write a check to the bank. And they buy that bond from the bank. So the Federal Reserve ends up with the, the uh, bond. But then the next month, those banks show up at the Treasury auction again. Now the Treasury has the, do the, the dollars, and the Federal Reserve has the bond. And this process repeats itself over and over and over again. And there's a buildup of dollars at the Treasury and bonds at the Federal Reserve. So we borrow currency into existence with an IOU, that bond, and the Federal Reserve opens up their big old checkbook that doesn't have a single penny in it and writes a bad counterfeit check and hands that to the Treasury, dollars spring into existence. Then the Treasury deposits that in the various branches of the government, and the government does some deficit spending on 
social programs, public works, and war. And then they pay those, uh, those uh, government workers, the uh, contractors, and the soldiers, and uh, all of those people deposit it in their private banks. Banks create money by monetizing the private debts of businesses and individuals. Federal Reserve Bank of New York. So, now the miracle of fractional reserve lending comes into play. Fractional reserve lending is just what it says. They reserve a fraction of what they've got. If you go into the bank and you deposit $100, the bank is allowed to keep $10 in your checking account in case you want some of that $100, and they get to steal $90 of it without telling you. Your checking account never has the balance that it says it's got in there. They have borrowed most of that currency out of there, and they're gonna loan it to other people. When those people sign that loan, currency actually gets created because you have $100 on deposit and they have 90, so now there's 190. Then they go and buy something. That's the reason they're taking out a loan. They're gonna buy a house or a car or something like that. And when they buy that thing, the seller then deposits it in his bank account. So that $90 gets deposited and then they get to go in and steal 90% of that, meaning $81. So now there's $271 on deposit. Can everybody see how the currency supply is getting magnified by the banks here? And that process happens over and over and over again, and under a 10% reserve ratio, every dollar deposited can create another 10. So if you deposit a trillion in base money, it can create 10 trillion. Uh, and that is basically it. There is nothing else. Our entire currency supply is either IOUs or receipts for IOUs. That's all that it is. It's all an imaginary agreement, and it is all given value because your experience yesterday is that a dollar purchased you something, so you expect that it's going to tomorrow. So you have this uh, agreement that is basically, you know, our entire currency system is imaginary. It doesn't really exist. It's just that we're all dreaming the same dream. If anybody chooses to wake up, it's over with. So it, it, it's really just a couple of bucks that is whipped up in this little voodoo hocus pocus scheme here where the Treasury and the Federal Reserve write out IOUs for, for each other. A check is an IOU, a bond is an IOU, and they swap IOUs, dollars spring into existence. A dollar is a receipt or a claim check on an IOU. <laughs> then the rest of the currency supply is a bunch of numbers that the banks type into their computers. They don't exist. In my book, I call uh, things money until I get to the point where I define what money is and the difference between money and currency. And from that point forward, I only call gold and silver money and I call everything else currency. But in the original manuscript, uh, when I start talking about the massive currency creation that's going on and how uh, banks are just debasing the currency supply all, all over the world and how this mandrake mechanism works, I start referring to it as the number supply, the M3 number supply, uh, the base number supply, because they're just numbers that somebody made up. I can write numbers on a post-it and hand them out like this, they make them up. They type them in the computer. It is nothing but a supply of numbers. How many numbers are there? <laughs> it's, it's infinite. So it's nothing but a number supply. But it becomes real when you work for some of that uh, currency supply, that number supply. And at that point, it now represents your blood, sweat, labor, ideas, and talent. You are what gives the currency supply value. It would have no value without, without you. And the way that that value is enforced, this is the really cruel joke here, is that you then save up a part of that currency supply so that you can pay tax to the tax collector in the United States, that's called the IRS, so that they can turn that over to the Treasury so the Treasury can pay the principal plus the interest on that bond, which was paid for with a check from nothing. 
So you can see that, right? Everybody sees how this works. Now, <clears throat> there's another joke. There was interest due on that bond. Let me ask you, if you borrow a dollar into existence, and that's the only dollar that exists on the entire planet, but you promise to pay back two dollars, where do you get the second dollar? Has anybody got the answer on that one? You have to borrow, well, you borrow it into existence. They, when people say that they're just printing money, they're wrong. First of all, they're printing currency, but they're borrowing currency into existence. They don't, the Fed doesn't just print money. What they do is they indebt us in the future. Every one of these loans that we took out at the bank that created the vast majority of our currency supply, 95% of our currency supply, roughly, has been created by the banks. Uh, I think actually it's 93% now, and the Federal Reserve created about 7%. But um, before the financial crisis, the, the actual physical paper dollars are what the Federal Reserve and the Treasury creates. It's known as base, they call it base money, I call it base currency. Uh, and then we create the rest of the currency supply by going to the bank and borrowing for a home or something like that, or buying dinner and signing a credit card. When you sign that credit card receipt, you've expanded the currency supply of the planet. The problem with this system is that every single month, there is a payment due on that bond for the principal plus the interest, and there's payments due on your home mortgages and on your cars and on your credit cards. Every single month, you've got to make a payment on that currency that you borrowed into existence. And on the balance sheet, that payment extinguishes the currency that you borrowed into existence. So the currency supply starts to collapse. This system requires that we go deeper into debt every month than we were the previous month. We have to always borrow more currency into existence than we are extinguishing every single month or the whole thing starts to collapse. And I'll show you what that collapse looks like in a minute. But first, I'm going to show you the base money. This is the, the these are the physical paper dollars. Uh, it's basically cash in circulation plus the deposits that the big commercial banks have at the Federal Reserve. Uh, all of the banks have a checking account at the Federal Reserve, and their deposits are all redeemable in paper dollars. So it's a measurement of how many paper dollars exist. It took 200 years to go from zero dollars in existence to $825 billion. Then came, along came the financial crisis of 08, and it has only taken two and a half years to triple that. We are now at about uh, $2.4 trillion of base money from 825 just two and a half years ago. So this looks like the currency supply of the, of the planet is just exploding when you look at this. And most economists and newsletter writers are talking about inflation, 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 that it's right around the corner this is going to happen. I believe that we're going to have, I, I wrote in my book, we would have the threat of deflation followed by big inflation, which we have already had. That's what this is. Followed by real monetary deflation, which is a collapse of the currency supply. Inflation and deflation are properly referred to as an expansion or contraction of the currency supply. Prices follow, but there's a delay. Uh, and so uh, consumer price inflation keeps your eye off the ball. If you can look at what's happening in the currency supply, you're seeing into the future. And I believe that there's going to be deflation first, and then all of the world's central banks will, will start printing like crazy to get us out of that uh, uh, deflation, and Ben Bernanke will be leading the charge. And so um, back in March of 2006, uh, the Federal Reserve hid their broadest measure of the currency supply. The currency supply, there's M1, M2, and M3. Uh, M1 is uh, uh, cash in circulation and uh, plus checking, checking accounts. Uh, M3 was the broadest measure that incorporated the most different types of, of bank deposits and so on. Not at all the entire currency supply. The entire currency supply is actually total credit. 
It's at about 53 trillion today, and it's uh, uh, stalled and started to shrink. But M3, they used to publish it every month. It was the uh, measurement of the currency supply that most newsletter writers and uh, on the news that they would report. And the Fed hid it from us in March of 2006, claiming that it was too expensive to compile this information and that it was useless anyway, that you couldn't glean anything from M3 that you couldn't get from M2. Now, <laughs> here's the real kicker. <clears throat> there is um, uh, M3 is you take a whole bunch of different monetary aggregates that the, that the Fed publishes, and you add them together, and you get M3. The only one that they don't publish, I believe it's um, uh, Euro dollars, or I can't remember. I believe it's Euro dollars. It was 0.6% of M3. So you can still reconstruct M3 off of all their other monetary aggregates, plus minus 0.6% accuracy. And there's several companies that do this. Uh, Shadow Stats, uh, Shadow Government Statistics, or shadowstats.com is one of them. It's by John Williams. He's one of the people that does. And all the people that do, their data agrees. So I am like 99.4, because it's 0.6% plus minus, I'm 99.4% sure that this information is correct. And what you see here is that there's a little collapse going on of the currency supply up here. And it's, it's not huge. We've gone from, uh, you know, uh, this would be 15, so about $14.7 trillion down to just under $14 trillion in M3. But base currency is a component of M3. That red part on the bottom is part of it. And they've been pushing that up like crazy. Why? Because there's a credit collapse going on right now. When you deduct the base money from the credit-based portion of, this por of, of M3, so the portion that we borrow into existence, what happens is it shows this enormous collapse going on. This is M3 minus base money. And there's a $1.7 trillion collapse of the currency supply. It's about 13%. Now, there's no time in history that this has happened. This goes back to 1960 except the beginning of the Great Depression. That was the last time the currency supply contracted was the beginning of the Great Depression. Usually, there's a time lag between stuff like this happening and the public feeling it. So the Federal Reserve is uh, borrowing currency into existence like crazy, and they're now doing direct purchases of bonds from, they don't even go through that open market operations shell game that keeps you from seeing what's going on. They're buying bonds directly from the Treasury. This is quantitative easing, they're calling it. And that means there's an emergency going on. Uh, they're telling us that everything's fine, that you know, all of their emergency efforts cured everything, and the economy is OK. What the hell is this right here? Why, in just the past couple of months, this is part of the quantitative easing, why is the currency expanding from uh, 2 trillion to 2.4. If, if everything was fine, the Federal Reserve would not be doing that. They're scared shitless. <laughs> That's what's happening. <laughs> They're doing anything they can to prevent this deflationary collapse that I predicted in my book. Uh, you know, I first started buying uh, gold when it was 325 bucks an ounce. Actually, it was 315. Uh, 326 for gold eagles. Uh, that was October 2002. By April 2003, I had discovered silver, and I was all in. I could see, I was reading in 2001 and 2, I was researching what was going on in the global economy every single day. I was addicted to it. And by October of 2002, I started making my commitment. And by April of 2003, I was all in. In 2004, I started speaking on it. In 2005, I incorporated goldsilver.com and became a precious metals dealer and started writing my book, and then it was published in 2008. So I didn't just bet my portfolio on it, I bet my entire life on it. I could see that there wasn't anything in history 
as far as finances go, that is, was as much of a sure bet, a sure thing, as gold and silver accounting for the expansion of the fiat currency supply. Gold and silver are denominated in this fiat currency, these digital numbers that they type into the computers and paper notes that they just run off of a printing press and it's all borrowed into existence. Periodically throughout history for the past 2,400 years they have done this. This is, the, the lower line is the value of the gold held at the treasury. So it's the, the uh, number of ounces of gold times the price. The upper line is the currency in circulation, base money. And this is from the year 1918, and here we have the stock market crash in 29, and these are the bank runs of the 30, where, 30s where people were asking for gold. But they printed too many receipts for gold. If you could go back to before World War I, these two lines would converge. They, they, they diverged there, and we created this lie where we were creating all these receipts for gold, these claim checks on gold that didn't exist. When people wanted it, Roosevelt had to make private ownership of gold illegal because there was a run on gold. And in the United States, Americans could not own gold. And then, a year later, they unpegged the dollar from gold, and the dollar's value plummeted so that it, took, it went from taking $20 to purchase one ounce of gold, it, it uh, then required $35 to purchase. So, they called it changing the price of gold. You can't change the price of gold when you're on a worldwide gold standard and gold has, you know, it's got a certain intrinsic value. The dollar fell. And so this, and what's amazing is it accounted for the currency supply. This is the free markets and the will of the public forcing the government's hand, forcing them to change the rules. Here's the same chart again, uh, but now I've taken the dates out further so that you can see uh, World War II, the expansion of the currency supply. Then in 59, uh, Charles de Gaulle, the president of France, uh, says, we want our gold. Other countries started jumping on board and gold started leaving the vaults. Then uh, I'm taking it out further because that one goes out to 1971. In 1971, we go off of gold, but there's another line here, a blue line. How many here would say that credit cards are replacing cash in circulation? Credit cards are replacing cash in circulation. I believe that they are, and when you sign a credit card receipt and you pay that merchant, the merchant's checking account does not know the difference between credit card currency that you created and cash that the Federal Reserve created. It can't tell the difference. And that currency that you created circulates until somebody saves it up and pays down credit card debt. And so uh, uh, I add that to the currency supply. Well, the, once Nixon took us off of gold and gold became a separately traded commodity slash currency, uh, the will of the public and the free markets drove the price of gold up until once again, the value of gold held at the treasury exceeded the currency supply and there was a year where we could have gone back on the gold standard and it also covered outstanding revolving credit for an entire month. So all it was doing is the same thing as it did in 1934 and in Weimar, Germany, and hundreds and hundreds of times since the year 407 BC with the first great inflation in Athens. This is the same chart again, but it shows Ben Bernanke panicking over here, and this is the increase of base money. That's that first chart that I showed you, not first chart, but the one that was a red area on the bottom. So that's the increase in base money. Well, there's the outstanding revolving credit piled on top of it. Uh, here's gold, and what this means is that gold has to rise from here to way up there to do the same accounting that it has already done twice in the United States and hundreds and hundreds of times in, in uh, history. This is a natural thing. It does this automatically. The will of the public and the free markets force this to happen, I believe, that it is, there's absolutely no chance in hell that this won't happen. Right now it takes about fifteen to twenty thousand dollar an ounce gold. So, uh, here is another way of looking at the same thing, and it's a great way of looking whether gold is undervalued or overvalued. If you take just the paper dollars, that base money, and you say there's a certain amount of paper dollars, how much gold do we have as a percentage of those paper dollars to cover them? And so gold is expensive when we've got too much gold, more than the paper dollars, 
and it's cheap when we don't have enough, and it's very cheap uh, when, uh, when it's way down here. Well, there's where we are as far as just the paper dollars. Here's when you add outstanding revolving credit. Um, this is what a debt collapse or a currency collapse looks like. We borrow uh, two units of currency into existence here. Uh, and uh, to do that, we promise to pay back, like, you know, we're borrowing this currency into existence with a bond. The bond is over here, so you got uh, these two units of debt plus interest. So you owe back more than you're borrowing into existence. But then each month, you're going to pay off a small portion of that debt. And so the next month, we go and borrow more into existence, and we pay off, we keep on paying off that debt every month, and we always have to borrow more into existence than we're paying off. But notice something. Do you notice how the debt is now growing faster? It was only 50% higher, but now it's double. It's 100%. It grows faster than the currency supply. There comes a day where this is unsustainable. If the public gets scared and they stop borrowing currency into existence, the whole, and they save up and pay down debt, the whole thing goes into a deflationary collapse. This is what I was predicting, and this is what is happening right now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is how much debt we owe compared to the size of our economy. If you uh, owe 50 cents and your economy is a dollar, you owe 50% of the size of the economy. If you owe 500 billion and your economy is 1 trillion, you owe 50% the size of your economy. It's the same either way. So uh, this, what this chart shows is how much debt the United States has, the national debt, compared to the size of its economy. And it goes back to 1792, which was when the original Coinage Act of the United States was created. And there was debt left over from the Revolutionary War. And what, so that's this debt here at the very beginning of the chart, right there. And what you see is that it never exceeded the 50% level until World War II. This includes the Civil War, World War I, and the establishment of the Federal Reserve, uh, the Great Depression. You see that during the 20s, we were growing the economy faster than the debt. And so the debt compared to the size of the economy is a smaller and smaller uh, portion because we were having the roaring 20s. The economy was growing, and the debt wasn't growing as fast. So on this chart, the debt is shrinking through the 20s. But then suddenly, in 1930, it, it goes up. Why? It wasn't because we were borrowing a whole bunch of currency and going into debt. It's because the economy shrank and our debt stayed the same. So that was the last great deflation. It got us into a, a deeper debt because we, we couldn't afford to pay the debt that we owed. Uh, it, it, the economy shrank faster. Then we do a deficit spending for World War II, and we could exceed this level of 50% because now we had this fiat currency system where we could just borrow currency into existence but when you do that, a bond, bonds range from like a month to 30 years out into the future that you're going to pay them back. That means we're borrowing prosperity out of the future. You remember how I said you save up some of the currency supply so that you can pay tax to pay the principal plus interest. So the prosperity that we're enjoying right now, this moment, is owed back in the future. We have to pay principal plus interest for the privilege now of having currency that we can use. Somebody is skimming off the top, basically. This is the way the banking system sort of skims off the top. It's through inflation. There's people that get rich off of this without having to do any work and, and, and uh, putting their value into the system. They get to skim purchasing power out of the system through inflation. But every dollar that we borrow into existence puts us in debt in the future. So we are, every year, borrowing prosperity out of the future, and we spend it today. The average rollover for all the bonds is about four and a half years. So the prosperity that we're enjoying right now, we owe back 
uh, we've got to pay for four and a half years from now. And right now, the taxes that you're paying are paying for prosperity during the Bush administration. <laughs> we already spent it. It's gone. So then we started growing the economy faster than we were doing deficit spending. So our debt compared to the size of the economy goes down during the Korean War and Vietnam. And then we have the end of the gold standard. And then Reagan says, deficits don't matter. We can just go ahead and spend as much as we want. And uh, the debt increases. This, just before this arrow of the financial crisis, there's a little slope where it starts to go down. That's the, the Clinton era. They say that we had surpluses. It was uh, bullshit. <laughs> if you look at, I don't look at the government's accounting of whether or not they say we had a surplus or a deficit. What I look at is the national debt. Did it go up? If it went up, it meant we spent more than we had. If it went down, it means we had a surplus. We had excess income above what we're spending. And during the Clinton years, there was never a year where the actual national debt went down. I don't know if the people in the United States, from the United States here, remember when uh, Gore and Bush were running against each other, they were both telling us how they were going to spend all this currency that was flowing in. You know, they were, they were each trying to compete on all the free crap they're going to give us in the future. And, uh, you know, that's how, well, actually, that isn't how Bush won, but <laughs> that's another story. Anyway. These statistics are from the Congressional Budget Office. This is what our government is going to tell us is, is going to happen in the future. And uh, it's not pretty. It's completely unsustainable. It is impossible. It cannot happen. You can't have a debt that is 10 times the size of your economy. It's not possible. Everything comes to a screeching halt first. And so something has to change. Right now, uh, I don't know if it got passed or not, but the government, uh, I, don't, I don't keep up with the news. I consider it all short-term noise. It distracts you from what is really going on. So I'm not sure, did uh, they settle on some sort of budget and is the government gonna keep on running? Does anybody know this? Yes, they did. Did the Republicans that were trying to get this thing passed where it was gonna pay down the debt, did they win? It's some sort of compromise. Because see, it's deflationary. It would cause a financial collapse to try and pay down this debt. You have to go into, in order for us to maintain the levels we've got and to maintain the prosperity, Obama has to be, uh, we have to be twice as far in debt when he leaves office than when he came in. Or we, the whole thing is starting to collapse. Uh, so, more proof that we are going into a deflation first. This is what a dead cat bounce looks like. This is the stock market. So stock rises, uh, it peaks, takes a little dip. A bunch of investors come in thinking that they're scooping up deals and they start buying and it rises again and then the crash continues because when they started buying it hadn't reached fair value yet. It, it had just rolled over, taken a little bounce and the market is still uh, looking for fair value. So there's the dead cat and it bounces. There's the NASDAQ. So that's uh, uh, what a dead cat bounce looks like. The initial crash on the NASDAQ was 38%. The total crash was 78%. This is the Dow of the, in the 1929 crash. And a dead cat bounce, uh, the initial portion of the crash was 48%. And the total crash was 90%. So the, in the first example, it was 38%, 78%. 48%, 90%. So if the initial crash is larger, the rest of the crash is going to be larger. We are going through a giant version of the 1929 crash or the NASDAQ crash. We just had the biggest crash in history, the Dow, which is supposed to be the biggest, uh, safest, securest, the 30 largest companies in the United States, uh, just crashed by 56%, and we're in a dead cat bounce, meaning that ultimately, the total crash should be greater than 90% from its high. Uh, this is the best way of measuring the value of a stock. And I'm sorry if I'm going fast and this isn't sinking in. I got a lot of stuff here and I got to cover it. Only got 20 minutes left. And I got to show you that the world's uh, stock markets and real estate bubbles 
have to continue crashing because all it is is the market trying to seek fair value. It's trying to seek equilibrium. This is what the markets do. It is their job. The S&P 500, the, these are P.E. ratios. How many here knows what a, know what a P.E. ratio is? Okay, how many do not? It's okay to raise your hand and say that you don't. Okay, it's the price of a, of a share of stock divided by the earnings of the company. So it's, it's basically how much is this stock co costing me compared to how much is the company making? And it's the, one of the best ways, the, entire industry, the stock market, the, the, the industry, the, the financial industry agrees that this is probably the best way of measuring the true value of a stock, whether it's overpriced or underpriced when you're buying it. The S&P only goes back to the year 1950, but Professor Robert Schiller of Yale University uh, reconstructed the S&P, took the 500 largest companies in America, and he took it all the way back to the year 1880. So you have uh, 120 years of, or 121 years of data here. Fair value is when P.E. ratios that are about 12, meaning you're paying 12 times the earnings of the stock. So if you buy a stock, it's going to take you 12, if nothing else changes and the company continues making the same amount every year, it's going to take you 12 years to make your uh, money back and be in profit. Uh, Undervalued is anything under 10. Overvalued is, is 15 to 18. And anything over 18 is a bubble. And so here's the data going back to the year 1880. And what you see here is that there is no time in history that we go from fair value to overvalued. Once it hits overvalued, it does not stop. It bounces on the way down. And it visits undervalued, overvalued, undervalued, overvalued, undervalued, overvalued, undervalued. The greatest bubble in, in history, the year 2000, PEs of almost 45, absolutely insane. Investing in a stock and having to wait 45 years to be in profit. This was nuts. And people were chasing stocks like crazy. This was the tech boom and so on. Well, it crashed down to fair value during the uh, market crash of 2008, and it bounced back into a bubble. We're at PEs of like 23, 24 right now. The stock markets seek equilibrium. They seek fair value over the years. This is their job. That is what they do. In, there's a famous trader named Bernard Baruch who said, in the short term, the stock market is a voting machine. It's like a stock machine. It's, I mean, it's a, a slot machine it's a, or a voting machine. It does the, what the public thinks it should, should do. The public chases after something and goes into a bubble. But in the long term, it's a weighing machine. It balances. It's scales balancing each other. That's what the stock market is always trying to do, seek fair value. It's only there for brief moments in history. But the point is that every time we are in a bubble, it visits severely undervalued. And the greater the bubble, usually the greater you overshoot fair value. Uh, this is the second best way of measuring a stock's value. And I, dividend yield, if you buy a stock for a buck and that company pays you six cents every year into your brokerage account, you're getting a 6% yield. I have inverted this chart because uh, the higher the yield, the more undervalued a stock is. The lower the yield, the more overvalued it is. So I inverted it so that bubbles are up and undervalued is down. Uh, so fair value is uh, four and a half to, to almost six. Um, so there you see the same pattern as before. But here's what's alarming, is that there is no time in the first 118 years of data that we have been in a bubble this large. This is absolute insanity, and it cannot last. There are two ways that the market can seek equilibrium. One, the market goes sideways for a decade while we have raging inflation. That will balance this out, and it'll bring dividend yields and PEs back into line. Two, it crashes. The markets go down. The, the currency supply is collapsing. Therefore, this has to be a deflationary collapse. We, this can't be an inflationary, what they call an invisible crash. Uh, these are the stock world stock markets. So there you have the US stock market, the, the uh, England stock market, Germany's stock market. This is Singapore and, the, and Japan. 
Notice that before the year 2000, Singapore and Japan used to trade in a different direction than the United States. The United States could be uh, going up while their stock market was going down. That before the year 2000, all the, all the markets of all the major economies trade in the same direction at the same time. Here is Brazil and here is Russia. And in about the year 2003, they started trading in the same direction. And since the market crash of 2008, all markets are just all world markets go the same direction at the same time. The S&P, the Dow, they're way, way overvalued in a bubble. We're having a deflationary collapse of the currency supply. The markets have to go down. When they do, the rest of the world, where, where the United States goes, so goes the rest of the world. These markets all have to collapse. Now, we have some real estate bubbles going on. The real estate bubble in the United States uh, took, <clears throat> it, it basically burst in the year 2007, 2008, and it's been falling. But I measure something called the mortgage rent ratio. Uh, fair value on a home is if you're paying about a, uh, a, a dollar to a dollar five for the, mortgage, the monthly mortgage on a 30-year mortgage, plus your carry costs like insurance and stuff, for each dollar that you could rent the house for if you were going to rent it. We went into a bubble of a buck 25 in uh, the 1989-1990. Fair value is, is about a buck five, and then we had the recession, and it went to 90 cents. On a national average in the year 1995, uh, real estate cash flowed by 10%, a single family median price home in the United States, except you couldn't get a loan back then. Uh, credit was tight, the economy was lousy. Then we went into this real estate bubble that was the greatest bubble in world history, where people were paying a buck 85, a buck 90, almost two bucks for each dollar that they could rent the house for. Uh, and, and then that bubble popped. And it came back down not to fair value, but to a buck 25 and bounced. So it came back down to the height of the previous bubble. It bounced, and we are right now at a buck 25. So valuations on real estate are still as high as they were in the bubble in 1989. They have to come down, or rents have to go up. This is all deflationary, which means that rents aren't going to go up. Real estate is going to come down. Uh, all of this travels together, like I said. Now, when the world's stock markets crash, does anybody know about the bubbles that are going on, uh, the real estate bubbles that are going on in the rest of the world? How many here are watching the videos that we produce each week on, on YouTube and so on? OK. Do you enjoy those videos? Yes, good. Are they informative? Do we try and sell you anything? No. All we do is we educate. And so here is a video that we made in Las Vegas. Uh, this is our driver. Very well-informed man, very educated. Uh, he was very informed on, on world finance, uh, the stock markets, real estate. He really knew what was going on in Las Vegas. And behind him there is a uh, big casino project. I can't remember the name of this one. Uh, there's the... Uh, uh, Venetian in the background, and there's a building going up in front of it. Uh, that this is the develop the casino project that they were developing, uh, and that's another shot of it. And see that tall building behind it? That's a hotel called the Fountain Blue. If you go to the other side of the Fountain Blue, what you notice is that there's a bunch of windows that are boarded over. This thing is skinned on the outside; it's not finished on the inside. They've got a billion and a half into it, and they're looking for another $3 billion to finish this thing. And this stuff is all over Las Vegas. It's not just in Las Vegas. It's all over the world. This is in Moscow. This is a development called Moscow City Center. Uh, there's the project, and you can't read this unless you read Russian. Uh, but all of these beautiful buildings here, there's nine buildings. One of them was in, completely in the framing stage. Another one was uh, halfway completed. Of the others, there are two that are occupied and one that is one-third occupied. The rest are just skinned over, and they're, they're not completed on the inside. The project is at a, at a standstill. Uh, and uh, then in front of this project, there's this giant hole in the ground. And this is where the centerpiece was supposed to be. This was Russia's bragging rights. 
This was going to be the tallest building in, building in Europe, Federation Tower, and it's a hole in the ground, and it'll remain a hole in the ground. That will never be finished. Does anybody know what the Singapore Flyer is? I've only got 10 minutes, and I'm not going to be able to finish this thing. It's a big Ferris wheel in Singapore. It's one of the tallest in the world, if not the tallest. I, I think it is the tallest. And here I am looking at their real estate bubble, and if you notice, there's cranes on top of all these buildings here. Uh, there's cranes everywhere. Look at all those buildings being built. Uh, all bubbles burst. We are in a worldwide credit bubble. When these markets roll over, the giant real estate bubbles that uh, were going up and then took a little breath when our markets crashed, their bubbles kept on going after pausing when, when our real estate bubble uh, popped and started reverting back to fair value. The markets are just trying to seek fair value. That's all they're doing. But people and the world's central banks go, oh my god, every time there's a little crash, we got to do something about it. It doesn't feel good to be in a recession, so they try and pump everything up, but they don't realize that they're just making everything worse later. Everything they do is going to come back to haunt them as more uh, inflation eventually. Uh, or, you know, th this deflation I'm talking about is the expansion of credit contracting. Uh, here's another thing that is going on that is going to mean that this decade is different than anything else that you have known. Uh, people don't realize that every 30 to 40 years, the world has an entirely new monetary system. It, it changes every 30, every 30 to 40 years. In 1873, Germany started the classical gold standard, uh, and by 1900, pretty much every developed country on the planet was on this standard where every note in circulation that was put out by their treasury was backed by an equivalent amount of gold. So it was 100% backing. Uh, then World War I happened. All the uh, combatants in Europe went off of the classical gold standard and started printing. And between the wars, we had something called the gold exchange standard where it was a mixture of debt and uh, gold backing the currency. Uh, then that, that was a very poorly constructed man-made system, and anything man-made cannot last. So basically they were, um, the Federal Reserve, under the Federal Reserve Act, there was a 40% reserve ratio, and they were allowed to put uh, a $50 bill into circulation for each $20 worth of gold that they had backing the $50. So they're putting claim checks on gold in excess of the amount of gold that they actually had. Ever since the Federal Reserve was born, we have been living under a lie. And if people say that we've got free markets in the United States, they are wrong. You cannot have free markets without free market money. Your, your currency is 50% of every transaction. All of the transactions are the free market. If there's a small group of men deciding what currency is, and how much the cost of currency is going to be, the interest rate, that isn't a free market. We do not have free markets. We haven't had since the year 1913. Then we have uh, something called the Bretton Woods system. The classical gold standard broke down. The Bretton Woods system was from 1944, where uh, all of the world's uh, currencies would be backed by the US dollar at $35 an ounce, and foreign central banks only could exchange those dollars for gold at the New York Fed for $35 per ounce. So all the world's currencies were pegged to gold but through the US dollar. Uh, all of these countries started asking for dollars and uh, gold flowed out of the vaults and Nixon had to take us off the gold standard in 1971. So you've got 30 to 40 years, 30 years, 28 years, 39 years plus, what's next? In this decade, there's going to be an emergency meeting of the G7 or the G20 countries, and they're going to be trying to hash out a new world monetary system, and they're already working on it. They're trying to figure out what they're going to do when the dollar collapses. Uh, here's the differences between the 70s bull market and today, and this is the reason I say that you really can't compare them. There isn't any comparison. And remember, in eight years, Gold went up 24 times its price, silver went up 36. These are enormous winnings in such a short period of time. Uh, in the 70s, 
it was basically North America and Western Europe that drove the price of the precious metals. The exchanges were the London Metals Exchange and the Commodities Exchanges in the United States. That's where the price of gold and silver was set. All of the USSR, they could not participate. There was no exchanges there. There's no market for gold and silver. And even if you could buy some, it was on the black market, so your investment did not affect the worldwide price. Those people were excluded in participating in, in this bull market and driving the price of gold forward. China under Mao, same thing. First of all, everybody was making a subsistence living. Very few people even had electricity, let alone being able to go in and invest in gold. India, Mexico, South America, these countries were all very poor at the time. The world's richest man is Carlos Slim and uh, he lives in Mexico City. Uh, you have massive investors in all of these countries now, and in Shanghai, investing is a sport. People will sit around in a room like this and watch tickers go by and make their bets. Uh, the rest of the world, Africa, I mean, pretty much, the whole rest of the world was excluded in that bull market, and gold went up 24 times and silver 36. So what, the, uh, and back then too, News traveled very slowly. You turned on that old vacuum tube TV set, waited 60 seconds for it to warm up, and then Walter Cronkite would come on and give you the price of gold. And, or you'd open the newspaper the next day and uh, get your news 24 hours after it happened, and then you'd pick up the telephone and call your broker, and if you were lucky, he could get an order onto the floor of the exchange for you the same day, but possibly the next day. So, News and reaction time was very slow. Uh, also, the development uh, of the investor mindset. Before the ERISA Act and before Nixon took us off of gold, before 1971 when Nixon took us off of gold, if you went to work be between your uh, late teens or, or mid-twenties, depending on whether you went to college or not, you could expect that if you saved 10% of your income every month, that when you got into your 60s, you could retire and live off the interest in your savings account. Can you do that today? Nobody can live off the interest in a savings account unless you got 20 million bucks sitting there, 50 million bucks. That's the only way you're going to get by. And you wouldn't leave it in a savings account because you're losing to inflation. Your principal is getting whittled away because of inflation. Uh, so my parents' generation were savers not speculators and investors. Uh, what's different today? Today, the entire world can participate. It's a, roughly 10 times the, the populations that can participate in this bull market. Uh, news travels at the speed of light over a tremendous variety of media outlets. You can get the news on your cell phone, on your laptop, um, on, and an investor crossing the Sahara. We're out filming in front of the pyramids, and there's this like Bedouin guy uh, sitting on the ground, and he's got some sticks, and he's starting a fire to make some tea, and he's on his cell phone. <laughs> this guy crossing the desert can take his Apple iPhone, check the price of gold, and place a trade right there. Is this a different world or not? Yes? yes. OK. Uh, then you have the development of the investor mindset. Along comes the, the tech bubble and NASDAQ, and everybody got themselves a trading platform and became a day trader. Uh, and then they got punished. The market crashed. Then you've got a real estate bubble that happens, and everybody starts chasing real estate. And then they get foreclosed on, and real estate. The bubble popped, at least here in the US and in, in England. The bubbles are still going on all down coastal China and Australia and New Zealand. Those bubbles are massive and they're about to burst. Uh, and so they got punished. Nobody has been punished on precious metals for 30 years. We, our memories just aren't that long. So the next great bubble is absolutely destined to be precious metals. Nobody has been burned on it. In, in, you know, nobody's the, nobody that's chasing after an investment to either secure their retirement or to buy them that new Lamborghini. Uh, and so 
the development of the investor mindset, this is really critical to try and figure out how many units of currency around the planet are going to come chasing the same tiny little pile of gold and a pile of silver that's about one-fifth the size that it was in 1980. Uh, it's at least 10 times the eligible populations. Each one of them has at least 10 times the currency. And, you know, as I think about this, it's probably greater than these figures. I was saying that there was somewhere between 10 and 100 times more investors, but think about this. In all of the USSR and China, more than half the world's population, there was not one investor. Not one. And today it's a sport in Shanghai. So I think this is probably over 100. It might be 1,000. I don't know. So you can take these figures and possibly add a zero to them, and that's the potential amount of units of currency that could come chasing the same. I mean, we had 2 billion ounces of gold back then. Uh, on the markets, and today there's 2.2, so there's 10% more gold. But silver, there's only about uh, 600 million ounces of silver on the exchanges, Five or 500 million ounces, 600 million ounces. Uh, here's a 747, and here's a little man with very strong legs that just dropped out of the sky. <clears throat> this is for scale. <laughs> and uh, if you took all the silver ever mined in history, it would fit into a cube about that size on the scale, and all the gold ever mined in history would be a cube about that size. However, gold has two basic functions, money and jewelry. And that's pretty much it. Only 5% of gold production gets used in industry. Silver is the second most useful commodity known to man. Oil is the first with about 30,000 uses. Silver is second with about 10,000 uses, but we use it in microscopic amounts. When you type on a keyboard, you're typing on silver. When you look at a DVD or a CD, you're looking at silver. When you look in the mirror, you're looking at silver. When you look through a thermal pane window, you're looking through silver. It's everywhere. It's a biocide. It's, it's uh, a, going into superconductors. It's going into RFID chips. But you know what? None of that matters. What's going to drive the price of silver is investment demand. It's the public rushing into this, and when gold gets too expensive for the public, they switch their preference to silver. This is what happened back in late 1979 and early 1980. Silver lagged gold, and then uh, silver just exploded because gold got too expensive. But silver has already been outperforming gold. And there will come a day when there's commentators on MSNBC, Fox News, CNN, and they're going to be showing you. Whenever, whenever you're in a bubble, whatever is in a bubble and the public is chasing, they want to hear about, and the news accommodates. They give you whatever you want to hear about. They don't tell you what they should be telling you. They tell you what you want to hear. And there's going to be people on there, like me, showing charts and saying, of course silver's been outperforming gold. There's less of it. There's five times more gold for investors to buy than there is silver. That's the reason it's been outperforming gold. So is it possible that silver could actually exceed the price of gold? Sure it is. All you have to do is look at these insane bubbles that haven't happened in the past, like the tulip mania of 1637. I don't know if it will. I don't actually expect it to. But it definitely could, because it's more rare. And the markets ha do something called the price discovery mechanism, where they try and find out. Uh, the, they set the price based on an equilibrium that's determined by the rarity of the two items. Uh, that's been going on for centuries. The price discovery mechanism is not broken. It still works. Uh, and I expect it to work. So we use up the silver. So the result is this is what they look like today. Now, cubes are, are deceiving. That, so the gold cube is actually about four, five times larger than the silver cube. If you take a cubic foot that's a foot by a foot by a foot, and you make it two feet by two feet by two feet, it hasn't doubled. It went, it's now eight cubic feet. So uh, as you double the measurements on a cube, it goes up in volume eight times. So there's actually about uh, four or five times more gold than there is silver on the exchanges that investors can buy. So when people come flooding into this, I do expect this. Right now, silver's value is 1 35th of golds. I expect it to outperform gold by at least a factor of 3.5. I'm expecting a 10-1 ratio at an absolute minimum. Uh, silver being one-fifth of gold's price is perfectly logical. Uh, 
if, if it's going up slow and it hits gold's price, then all the industry will just switch to gold because that's the only other metal they can use in most of these instances. They can use platinum, rhodium, palladium, and gold, but they only mine 5 million ounces each per year of platinum, rhodium, and palladium. They use 900 million ounces of silver. So there's not enough of those other metals. The only alternative to silver in most of these applications, like keyboards and electronics, is gold. Uh, so if it was going up slowly and it did hit the price of gold, gold could stop it in its tracks. If there's a rush, it could go pa blow past it. However, silver is much cheaper to mine than gold, and it wouldn't stay there. Uh, we're always trying to figure this stuff out at our company, trying to measure it and see when to buy and when to sell. Now, uh, can you roll that? Uh, th this is a clip from one of our YouTube videos, and this is the insider's video that uh, our customers at goldsilver.com, they got to see this two months ago, and then we just released it on. And so this is the type of information that you get. And when we're nearing a top, our customers are going to be informed on what we are doing. So could you roll that video, please? And what you see is that when you're coming off of a bubble, when it's overvalued, it has never in 130 years just gone back to fair value and gone back up into a bubble. It always continues on its uh, way down in a bear market until it goes to severely undervalued, and then a new bull market starts again and they start rising. Well, we are in a bubble. It has to seek equilibrium. It's probably going to blow right past it and go to severely undervalued, just like it has every time for the past 130 years. So real estate and stocks are doing this at the same time while we are in a bull market for precious metals and there is a problem with currencies. So we are going to be measuring all these things very carefully and then using some confirming indicators that should flash to us when to get ready to sell and we're going to be letting you know. So thanks a lot and I hope you had some great holidays. I'll see you later. I was standing in front of a green screen just sort of drawing these charts out of memory and our animator Aiden had to sort of float the charts in front of me and move them around to match them up with my finger. But um, uh, that is what you get as a customer. It's on the YouTube channel Why Gold and Silver. So if you do a search for Sell Silver Mike Maloney, because it's when to sell your gold and silver, but Sell Silver Mike Maloney. You'll get that video in its entirety, and there are dozens of videos on why gold and silver, gold Mike Maloney, and wealth cycles. So those are the three YouTube channels that you can go to, and each one of them has uh, a few dozen videos on it. Uh, if you, this is the gold panic in 1948 in Shanghai. Uh, if you wait until the last minute, you know, I'm not very good at swearing. Robert Kiyosaki is great at it, so I usually don't swear much on stage. But if you wait until the last minute, you are shit out of luck, up shit creek without a paddle in a barbed wire canoe, fucked. <laughs> Thank you. I'm at the second to the last frame here. Here's one thing that people do not realize. Uh, it does not take Ben Bernanke to print, us into, to print the dollar into oblivion for gold to go to $10,000 an ounce, $50,000 an ounce, $100,000 an ounce. All it takes are a few very wealthy investors to try and get theirs before the masses wake up and the herd comes charging in. The, this is the masses, and they will be, this, these are the people waking up out of their beer and, do, in, and football induced comas and uh, coming in at the last second. Well, this is a sort of a different situation because their currency is going to go to zero because of war. But, but basically, uh, you got to get in ahead of the trend and then get out when everybody else is panicking like that. Uh, like I say, this is the greatest wealth transfer in history. But you have no idea of the scale until you think, if we do have a change in our monetary system, and if we have to go back to some sort of asset-backed currency, that means that the people that are holding non-asset-backed currencies, which is all the currencies on the planet today, 
their wealth is transferred to the holders of precious metals. This is the greatest wealth transfer in history, therefore it's the greatest opportunity in history. By the way, is Stephanie Ring here? Does Stephanie stand up for just a second? Stephanie's uh, grandfather's sister uh, was a secretary during the Roaring Twenties and through the stock market crash, and then in the depths of the Great Depression, she started buying stock when everybody else was selling and when stocks were like the bad, the poison investment that you did not want to get involved in. Stephanie's grandfather's sister started buying these stocks. She is an example of wealth cycles. She rode these stocks up, and I don't know exactly when she did it, but she must have had sort of an innate sense that the stocks were overvalued, and she sold the stocks and she bought real estate. If you go to the French Embassy in Washington, D.C., that was her hotel. Thank you, Stephanie. So, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you out in the lobby where you can get uh, free hundred trillion bucks from us. Thanks. Uh, so, I just came off stage at the event, and you know, it's great. The event went great. Uh, it was everything, all the information was very well received. Uh, it was a great audience, but you know, um, even though it is so rewarding to uh, talk to the people live and hear their reaction, uh, still reaching uh, a few hundred or a few thousand people at a time is not good enough anymore. We are really in an emergency and we need to start reaching millions of people at a time and that's uh, you know, why I'm trying to go more video oriented than traveling around the planet like I have been country by country uh, telling uh, 400 to 4,000 people at a time. Uh, so, uh, you know, hopefully, um, I'm hoping that I don't have to make any more <laughs> personal appearances uh, and that I can just uh, produce videos, write books, and get the information out there as fast as possible and reach millions instead of thousands. Uh, well, we've been working on a documentary and we have been around the world. Uh, Taiwan, uh, uh, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, uh, London, uh, St. Petersburg, Russia, Moscow, uh, Germany, uh, Rome, Paris, uh, Athens, Greece, and we shot in front of the pyramids in Egypt. It's, it's been a spectacular uh, uh, trip trying to uh, put together this documentary. Uh, and we, I think that it's going to be really enjoyable for people and highly educational. Yeah, no chance in hell that it's going to happen. Uh, they, as, as far as a one world currency that everybody is going to use. But what you see here is that in the XAU, since the early 80s, uh, the, uh, on the average, gold and silver outperform the stocks on the average. So you yeah. got to act, you got to get started. That's why. Yeah, the free market's always over overwhelmed manipulations. It, it's, eventually, it's, it's a doomed plan. Eventually, it, it, eventually it, it, it will fail. Yeah. And, but, you know, you got to gotta position yourself accordingly. You know, you got to be ready. You can't wait because you can see two, 300, 400 point gap days for gold. So gold. Basically, uh, you know, one thing you find out is all fiat currencies eventually fall to their intrinsic value, uh, which, because they've ruined it by putting ink on it, is the, uh, the amount of energy you can extract from it, the amount of BTUs from combustion <laughs> when you burn it. And uh, you saw that during the Weimar hyperinflation. People used the currency as fuel to heat their house. Currencies have been backed by oil, by gold and silver, by land. Uh, well, as soon as you remove something that you can't, something that puts uh, financial constraint on them, uh, where you can't just print as much of it as you want, the currency is pretty much doomed. It's beyond astonishing. And if, yeah. it, it, was, if it wasn't for the horrific effects, it would be more ludicrous. It would be actually comical that we could stand up and, and have some fun with it. But the, it is actually horrific. When you look back in history for the last 3,000 years, every episode of this kind of silly crap ended very, very badly.